Please pause the video and take a moment to read this important safety message. Hey, welcome back everybody. A fun video here at Blue Glow Electronics today focused on the restoration of our Knight KB85, otherwise known as maybe the KG85. Um, I think what I've found is the difference between the two model numbers is one of them was a factory built unit and the other was a uh, kit. And from what I can see underneath this one, it was a kit. Anyway, these are amazing little amplifiers. They um, they run two EF86 preamps on the front end. Then it uses a pair of 12 AX7s as a um, inverter. And then typically um, these came from the factory with a set of EL37s, which uh, if you know much about the EL37, they're a fairly rare tube these days and kind of pricey and costly. And then it uses a pair of five AR4s here in the rectification of this amplifier. And um, some of them came with the cage. I think the cage was a, an, a, an additional option you could buy. And some of them just came with the amp and the chassis. But I'm going to do a general walkthrough of it and then we'll walk you through the restoration. And here we have the unit with the cover off of it. Um, as you can see, there are, on the back side here, you can see two large electrolytic capacitors um, on this unit, along with the power transformer here. Um, they do a split rail power supply in this. So at a certain point, they kind of split the left channel from the right channel um, from a uh, kind of CRC standpoint, filtering standpoint. Um, as you can see here, it has two GZ34s, one on each side, and that those two are kind of ran in parallel with each other to double the current capacity um, that these, the rectification can provide. And then you have in here the four tubes that would be where the, uh, the EL37s. In this case, it has been converted to a, um, EL, I mean a 6L6 output tube, and you just simply have to rebias the tube uh, when you do that. Then what you've got are two heavy-duty potted um, standalone output transformers, and then you've got the 12AX7s. Um, this would be one channel, and that would be one channel. So you end up with a kind of a channel here and a channel there, uh, the EF86, and then you've got the 12AX7 there. So some people call this the Macintosh MC240 killer. Um, apparently this unit came out in uh, kind of direct competition with the Macintosh uh, 240 and, um, you know, similar tube lineup and whatnot. The 240 either ran 7027s or 6L6s here. And there's a lot of people that believe this is equal or, um, I'll just say, just as good of quality. Um, and sounds just as good as the Macintosh at a whole lot lower price range than the uh, than the Macintosh was back in the day. Um, a couple other things. You've got some ability here to adjust the balance on these tubes. And then you've got the ability here to measure the kind of the uh, cathode current on each of these tubes. We'll talk more about that as we get into the restoration. And if you flip the unit around here on back, you've got kind of a volume knob. So if you wanted to use this as a standalone amplifier and feed maybe your iPhone or a, uh, you know, some type of media player device into here and use this as volume, you can. The volume is separate for each channel, so you have to adjust the left and right. Got a mono stereo switch. You've got a set of outputs that look a whole lot like the Macintosh. <laughs> Outputs, um, but you and they're even labeled very similar. You got C here for common four, eight, sixteen, and thirty-two. Um, you've got a gain balance test here. You got your uh, it says four amp slow blow fuse, and then you got your power power switch, and then your standard two prong cord for back in the day. Let's flip it upside down and let you take a look underneath. All right, for those of you watching my um, video series on troubleshooting tube amplifiers and gear or whatnot, um, this will be a little redundant for you. I'm trying to find a good balance going forward where I kind of troubleshoot a piece of gear and what may be wrong with it in the troubleshooting series. And then if we decide to do a full restoration, I'll kind of break that out and do it separately. And I'll try to keep as, as much of the redundancy out of it as I can. So hold tight if a little bit of this is redundant. But the bottom line is 
Here we go. All right, underneath here you've got the power transformer. So it is shared between left and right channels. Then you have the first thing you, your rectifier sees after that is a, I mean your power supply sees after that is these rectifiers, these GZ34s right here. And these are ran in parallel, so think of them as one tube, okay? It's not a rectifier for the left channel and a rectifier for the right channel. They're just kind of bootstrapped in parallel. The first thing you see after that then is the 16 microfarad capacitor, and then following that you see this choke. So these are shared components between left and right channel. Then it kind of does the split rail power supply, and it sends one channel over here to this capacitor, and another channel over here to this capacitor, and it uses some dropping resistors along the way to give you various voltages um, for various parts of the circuit here, okay? If you kind of move on forward here, you've got your four um, output tubes, you've got your uh, little stick resistors here, which are the cathode resistors being used in this. Um, you've got these uh, 1K ohm resistors here that are really the grid resistors on the front end of these tubes. And then really you've just got kind of some wiring between sections. And then what you end up with is like the right channel here and the left channel here. And you can see you've got your balance knobs uh, that come over here and are mounted in the center here. Um, and then a few other things along the way. Certainly your power cord here. Um, your power switch, your fuse holder, um, let's see, we come along, we've got the, uh, I'll see if I can tilt this up a little bit so you can see the inside here. Um, you've got this uh, monitor switch, which is part of a test we can walk through later. Um, then you've got the terminal strips for the outputs. If you'll notice here, you've got a little capacitor and resistor coming off the 16 ohm taps. That's your feedback. Um, so this capacitor and resistance determines how much feedback happens in the circuit. You got the mono switch here, and then you got your two RCA input jacks. So it's it's relatively a simple amplifier. These little preamp boards up here, though, are kind of the bane <laughs> of, um, of pain here because you basically have to pull these completely out to restore them. You can't get to them from the top. So we're going to do that as part of this. And then you've also got these jacks along the back here. Um, and I talked about these earlier in the troubleshooting series. Um, I do not like these jacks whatsoever here. Let me tilt it a little bit so you can see them. There you go. So what these are are normally closed jacks. They have little switches here on them. So when nothing is plugged into it, this little connection is made and your current flows through here and back out through here and completes the circuit, okay? The problem with that is what's feeding over here and through these and back out is your cathode current um, going to your cathode resistor here off the tubes. So for whatever reason, one of these gets corroded or opens up, you lose your con your conductivity in the tube because you've uh, basically opened your cathode at that point and the tube will stop conducting. So these are a little gimmicky in my opinion. I think we're going to replace them and instead what we're going to do is wire a little 1 ohm resistor in um, series with each of these cathodes and then we'll make this a measurement across that 1 ohm resistor. So if you had, you know, 20 ohms, 20... Um, volts here, um, you would know over here that you've got 20 amps, or if you got 0.2 volts, you would know you would have 20 milliamps or whatnot over here of current, of cathode current, and that's a much easier way, and, and if this opens up, because that's in parallel with the cathode, it doesn't take anything away from your circuit versus today if this opens up in any way, shape, or form, it gets corroded. It basically takes a tube out of the circuit at that point. So we'll, we'll likely rewire these. So I'm going to break this video into two parts today. What, what we're going to do, or two parts, what we're going to do today in today's video is we are going to basically make a list of parts and get them ordered and um, might take a week or two for all those parts to show up. So in the meantime, we can take this off the bench and start another restoration and kind of do the same thing. Make a parts order, get a video up, 
and um, keep kind of going that way. So don't get lost if I show something else before I come back and show part two in this. I'm just waiting on parts to show up. Okay, as you guys know, I typically use a notebook here of some sort, and I will start making a parts list, and I'll kind of label what it is here. That way, if I ever come back to needing to uh, restore another one of these, I've got it in a notebook. I know I could go electronic and keep all that online. I keep my whole personal life and work life online. Um, but this hobby, I, I tend to like the notebooks for some reason. Maybe it's just the analog nature to tie with the analog gear I'm working on here. But at any rate, um, I'm sure there's better organization systems than what I'm doing. At any rate, um, I'll always make my list of capacitors first. And the easy ones to figure out are the big can caps here on the outside because you can just simply read what they are, okay? And if you'll notice here, I read these off. It's 60 microfarads at 500 volts, 30 microfarads at 450, 40 microfarads at 250, and 40 microfarads at 100. And I made a note here, these things are four and a half inches tall and I need two of these. So I went online and started looking tubes and more. I checked eBay. I checked um, a couple other places um, and could not find anything that matched up with that. I found stuff that I could have gotten three of these and then I could have mounted another unit underneath, but I'm a big fan of uh, kind of trying to keep things as original as can be. So I reached out to Hayseed Hamfest and asked them if they could provide me with two can caps with all these specs and not apply the paper labels on them. I just wanted the uh, shiny can caps. And they replied back to me the following day and gave me a price. They were going to be $41 a piece for these. So um, so I basically got $82 plus shipping in these two caps. And I've, I've just placed the order for those today. So they should be here in a few days. Um, as I went down the list, here's this 16 microfarad at 700 working volts. And that is what that'll end up looking like. Uh, CE Manufacturing actually makes a direct <laughs> kind of bolt-in replacement, and it even comes with a little strip tie to hold it down. But um, that's what we'll end up using in this unit for that. Then I started writing down the uh, 0.25. At, at, I wrote 200 volts. Honestly, this is on the front end here of your RCA jack, so this could be very low voltage. Um, probably even get by with you know 50 or 100 volt cap right here. Um, typically, little uh, ceramic caps like this that um, are being used in the feedback loop, they're very rarely bad. Matter of fact, I probably won't replace those. I'll leave that alone. Only if I got into testing the unit afterwards and thought I had a problem, would I with the feedback loop would I go there. Um, next up to get to the other capacitors I've got to pull these two boards out. Oh yeah by the way I wrote down here one safety X1 Y2 cap I'll end up replacing kind of the the death capacitor right here with um, with one of those and that's really the main capacitors. I mean that one can cap has most of the power supply capacitors in it. Um, so we're going to pull these boards next. I will tell you, um, I will start checking resistors. So we will pull the tubes in a minute and check these cathode resistors with the pull tubes pulled out and see if they're close to 1K. If not, we'll end up uh, getting four 1K resistors for this. Um, we will check the cathode resistors here with these did I call these cathode? I'm sorry. These are grid grid resistors on the front end, kind of uh, grid stoppers. These are your cathode resistors, um, 260 ohm on each. Um, I will pull the cathodes out and test these two as well, and then we'll test the, the things on this board when we get them out. All right, to get these little units out so you can get these boards up, you got to take the, the nut off the front here of this uh, on the little shaft, and you've got to come back here and take this one off. And at that point, these will loosen up and can be slid out of the way enough to remove the four screws in the corners of these boards. And if you pull the tubes out, then these boards will pull right up. Um, you may end up having to desolder a few of these wires going over. So I'm going to take some really good pictures of what I've got going on here with my phone. Um, that way, if I you know get ready to put it back together, I always have good pictures showing me exactly what wires went where.
Okay, I just used a half inch wrench. You may be tempted to try to get these uh, knobs off with a pair of pliers or some other channel locks or whatnot. Try to get you a uh, chrome plated um, wrench. It just, the chances of you slipping and or scratching something else on the face, and this goes for any audio knob, um, a little restraint here, holder um, removal. Uh, try to use a chrome um, Try to use a chromed um, wrench here if at all possible. This is gear wrench is what these are. But um, once you get these loose, if you'll notice these, uh, these will pull back and this will slide up. Okay, up next you are going to have to unsolder a lot of these points here on the board um, where the wires go down to it to be able to get these boards out. So, as I recommended earlier, I just took about 15 pictures with my phone. Digital pictures are really inexpensive. Um, not knowing where a wire goes back and putting it in the wrong place can be very costly. Sure, you can go back to the schematic or the build original build manual. That'll just cost you a lot of time. Pictures make this uh, make this work easy. So I'm going to get all the wires soldered to this board, these two boards unsoldered at this point. And um, no rhyme or reason to what I'm doing here. Typically when I desolder something, I try to pull it back a little bit, but not like way over here out of the way, because then I might not know where it goes back to or it makes it harder to trace. So try to keep them in the vicinity, um, but not right on it. Okay, at this point we've got all the boards unsoldered. One thing I will point out to you, this unit does not use the chassis for ground in a lot of cases, which I actually think is really good. It uses this grounding bus wire here that runs along. Let me see if I can get it where you can see it. But it comes off of kind of the uh, the ground here at the power supply and it feeds along and then it feeds over here to the other side and kind of along. And um, then this capacitor on this side has a feed that comes over and ties in with that. So, um, so there's not a lot of tie points to the chassis, which I actually like. I think it can go a long ways to keeping everything on the same bus. If you've ever watched any of my videos on building an amplifier, like the single-ended amplifier, we talk about kind of bus versus star and different uh, grounding techniques, and I actually like this one a lot. It does cause the wires to kind of be in your way here a little bit, and you have to deal with some of that, but in all, it's a great way to go about uh, grounding kind of your um, power supply and your uh, and your ground uh, plane for the uh, components in this. Up next, though, just a standard quarter inch uh, little uh, nut driver here. We'll take all of these nuts off these boards and we'll be able to lift them off. We learn as we go here. I'm having to take this uh, pallet, this uh, V7, V8 balance pot out right here so that I can get to the bolt hidden underneath of it. So it's more than just the uh, the two that have to be removed for this. Okay, once you get the bolts loose, it's just a matter of kind of popping this up, and then you'll have to find your way out with this board. And I might find that, uh, yeah. let me work, there it goes, it's coming. Just take your time with these. You may find something's hung or hooked or whatnot, and you may have one more thing to get out. I don't think I do here, but, um, so if you take your time and work with them, eventually you will get these boards out. And if you'll notice, there's a wire that also feed that would have fed from uh, from this board down and into um, tube sockets and whatnot. But you can see here, boy, I hate these types of tube sockets. Um, they're not the uh, the best type, but I don't know an easy fix. I saw online at one point where somebody was remanufacturing these boards. Looky there. Somebody came to the trouble. This just baffles me. I don't get it. Okay. Um, they went to the trouble of all you had to do to pull this board out, right? And what did they do? They replaced a coupling cap right here. And they left another one just like it that's bad, another one that's just like it that's bad, an electrolytic that hasn't been changed since 1962. I just don't get it. When you would have something like this out and you've gone to the effort of pulling that out, time, time, my friends, <laughs> time is money. And time is what we have the least of in life. So um, 
if you take the time to pull this out, go ahead and spend the five or ten dollars it's going to cost to do this so that this unit will last another 50 years. Replacing one, you're just waiting on this other part component here to die a year or two later. And by the way, they used a two microfarad. I like to go to the schematic, but I'm betting a hundred dollars this is not the right cap that's supposed to be in here. So to back up a little bit, I bought this amp off of eBay. Um, the guy sent me lots of pictures of the outside, sent me none of the inside. He basically said he was scared to take the cover off of it, but it had just been gone through by a professional tech and totally restored. Hmm, I'm seeing two components that have been swapped at this point, and a lot of others that should have been. This is not a total restoration. At any rate, I'm, while I've got this board out, we're going to go through and uh, get these parts written down here. All right, we got the other unit flipped over here, and uh, I don't think this one's been touched ever. This, interestingly, this has a metalized paper and foil capacitor here in this two microfarad slot, and it was a two microfarad capacitor. But what's blowing my mind is these are historically known for going bad, and these metal um, paper and foil enclosed in oil inside of the, the metal containers with the glass seals on the end, typically don't. Um, not saying it couldn't have been, it's just, you know, you always have your speculation <laughs> when you're working on stuff like this, and I'm just, I'm speculating this was played around with by uh, someone with without a ton of experience, but that's okay too, you know, everybody, everybody's got to learn. Um, but yeah, we will definitely, uh, get the parts written down off of this list. By the way, while I've got these, I'm going to go ahead and replace all the resistors and capacitors on these boards and totally rebuild them. Why wouldn't I uh, make these things last another, another 50 years? All right, bad news, good news. Bad news was a lot of the components on that board, capacitor-wise, you cannot read the writing on anymore. Any of these large tubular ones, I was struggling to read the writing. Good news is you can find out on the web the KB85 um, assembly manual. And in it is a really nice clear picture of exactly what's in it. Now I am going to do a little cross-referencing back and forth just to make 100% sure that everything is good. Um, but from what I can see here thus far, everything's looking good. I probably won't replace these little... Um, kind of ceramic caps here, but um, all the resistors and all of the uh, coupling caps and this electrolytic for sure. Okay, as you can see here, I've got all the parts listed out here that I need. Um, we've got all of our caps listed out. Then I made a list of all the resistors and um, how many, what wattage, and what R number they were off of that schematic um, that I showed you the uh, PDF of. Um, the only two things I didn't label in here were these two stick resistors. Um, I measured those. Those are in good shape. But I am going to go ahead and replace these four um, grid resistors here, these 1K ohms. So I'll add that to my list. And I'll take a picture of this list and upload it on my website under sketches and info. But this point we're going to call it a wraps for um, part one here because I'm going to go get all these parts ordered, and hopefully they will show up here in a week or so. And then we can uh, install all this and bench test and bias and whatnot. And, uh, oh yeah, by the way, adapt these. Uh, I do need some 4 1-ohm resistors. I'll add that to the list as well. Or you can use 10-ohm. Um, you can do the math either way. But I wouldn't go any larger than 10-ohm because you really don't want it to affect the circuit um, at play. All right, before we call it a wraps, uh, a couple things. Most of these parts I have in stock. The two can caps are what I'm waiting on, and I don't, you know, Hayseed has to custom make those. So I'm, but every time I've ordered from them, I've gotten stuff within about a week, so it's not like it, you know, it takes a month or two. So hopefully soon. I, but I just thought I'd show you there's some manuals out here online. I will, if I think about it, I will upload these to my website, so they'll be there for you. Um, you've got nice diagrams of how you would go about wiring all this up and mounting things and routing wires and whatnot. Um, they did a really good job on this. So if you were assembling this from a kit uh, back in the day, you had bought this from Allied Radio. 
it's all there. And then you've got a nice clean schematic here, which you can kind of zoom in on and blow up and uh, covers all the details of this unit, as well as they also have a nice um, assembly man manual here that walks you through all the specs on this unit. Um, it walks you through the features, performance curves, testing they did, how it's rated power wise, um, intermodulation, distortion, um, things of that nature. I mean, it's a full, here's how you go about it step by step by step, and then things like I was using a minute ago um, and whatnot. So, very, very good uh, diagrams here. So, if you haven't known one of these, it's. Uh, it's a great amp because you've got a lot of documentation out here on it as well. And a really good parts list. There you go. At any rate, guys, I'm going to call this one a wraps and uh, we'll be back on parts two. I'll do a schematic walkthrough with it and you'll see me uh, putting components in this unit and then bench testing it. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. Stay tuned. Lots more good stuff coming.